book of Acts and I've been kind of talking around this different comments and different people that uh, I've talked to and it seems that most of us have really been enjoying going through here. I always love the book of Acts because it's, it's got so much practical, rich stuff in it and um, things that are just good examples of what church should be like. Um, you know, when you think about the early church or some people say, well, that was the early church. No, that should be the church now. <laughs> That's just when the church was getting established. If we don't have the book of Acts in our life just as the foundation, we're missing something huge. And, um, and so the book of Acts is our example of how we are to do church. And so it's, it's a powerful, powerful book. So I just encourage you to you know, continue to read ahead, study ahead. Like I said, get commentaries, different things, start reading ahead, uh, reading with us, studying on it, um, because there's a lot of good things. And we know that all through the book of Acts, what we studied up to this point, a lot of outwardly things have gone on. You know, God continued to move, continued to add to the church daily. Um, and not only did he continue to add to the church, um, we, we've seen people that were healed. I mean, all kinds of amazing things that were happening. And, of course, we know that sin ends up getting into the church and the nice and Sapphira and God will not put up with sin in the body. Um, matter of fact, we learned in that what does God say in his word in Peter? He says judgment doesn't start out in the world. It starts in the house of God. So God's telling us we got to get our hearts and our own selves right. You know, kind of like the second Chronicles 714 doesn't tell the world to go out and repent. It says church repent and then I'll heal your land. And so there's a lot of good stuff in that. And then we see we see that they, you know they end up with persecution again in and out of jail. Just different things are going on from the outward and the inward. Just different things are going on, and and we know that God begins to increase again. Um, the number in the in the church and the priests were getting saved, and just great things were happening. And then all of a sudden we get to chapter six and we find another but, and it's like man alive. This sounds like the children of Israel. <laughs> But when you really think about our own lives, don't we kind of act like the children of Israel a lot? I mean, think about that. We're in and out, back and forth. Different things are going on all the time. And we're kind of like the, the children of Israel, just back and forth. It's crazy. So 6, 1 through 7 is what we're going to focus on this morning. And there's some change that is going on and, uh, in the church. And um, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the idea of embracing change means that we have to embrace difference. We have to. We can't do what we did 40, 50, 60, even 10 years ago and expect it to work today. It's not going to. And if you're stuck in that rut, well, if you want to go find yourself in a graveyard somewhere in a dying church, go ahead. But I don't know about you, but I want to be a church alive that's worth the drive. But that means that we got to do some changing. There's some things that we have to embrace that maybe we don't necessarily like. There's some things that, that I'm learning that I don't like, but I'm going to have to change it. I'm going to have to embrace. Why? Because we live in a different culture and a different time, and it isn't easy. It's not easy. I was sitting, and I had the weirdest thought come through me this morning. I was sitting up here and praying this morning, and you know, this baptistry in this back room was actually an addition to the building. I think most of us know that um, uh, on in the years of building the church. And I sat here, and I was as I was praying, I was thinking, and I don't know why I was thinking about this, but I was, and I started thinking, I was like, how exciting it must have been for the church to know they had to build an addition onto the building. How exciting it must have been for the church to know that they needed a new wing, and they built the education wing. How exciting it must have been for the church to have gone through those phases because growth was taking place. But there's one thing that I can guarantee that growth did not take place without change being required. Something had to change. Something had to spark. Something had to get moving. And people had to make up their minds either I'm going to be part of that or I'm not going to be part of that. And those that were part of that, what ended up happening? They began to see the church grow. They saw the new wing happen. They saw the expansion to the back here. They began to see different things happen. Why? Because they were willing to step out and embrace it. Even though they may not have understood it. And I guarantee that when you were in your 20s and in your 30s, and you were in church, and you thought the old timers and the old way of doing things was outdated, 
Now think about what the 20s and 30s think today about us. Yeah. So what does that mean? That means there's some thinking that we got to change. And, and that's okay. But that doesn't mean we change the message. Amen? The message is the same. And that's where people, I think, get a lot of fear that's created. And this is kind of, in a, kind of in a way, this is kind of what is going on here in the book of Acts. Because up to this point, the church, I mean, they're, they're at it daily. And just looking at the calculations of reading the scripture, eh, there's probably calculated between 15, 20,000 men that's recorded up to this point that within a less than a year have been saved and come to Christ. That's pretty powerful. Not counting women and children. You count women and children, you probably look at forty to 50,000 people in a year that has given their life to Christ. That's powerful. What's even crazier about it is they didn't have a building to meet in. They were meeting in houses. They were meeting in temples. They were just meeting wherever they could meet. Yet they met and they were on fire for God. That, that blows my mind. So there had to be some kind of organization, something that was going on there. We knew that they were in Jerusalem, which was kind of like a metroplex or a melting pot of all kinds of different religions and backgrounds. And although Judaism was a huge one in Jerusalem, there was a, this a melting pot of cultures and things that were going on in this area. But God begins to do all this stuff, and then we come to Acts chapter 6, verse 1, and it says this, Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, and here's what, here's what I want you to understand, is it says right here, addition. Simply, and in some places it says increasing in number. A complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Jews. Oh boy, here we go with some complaining. You want to create a mess in the church, start complaining about non-essentials. Non because their widows were being overlooked. Now this is not a non-essential. Think about that for a second. They're not complaining because it's too cold or it's too hot or there's not enough light or I don't like the color or I don't like this or man that was, too, that was five minutes too long or that was ten minutes too short. Or, they weren't complaining about all this. What were they complaining about? Their widows were getting overlooked. To me, I'd say that was a necessary essential. Something we got to do. The Bible talks about taking, doing what? Taking care of our widows and taking care of our orphans. Matter of fact, James chapter 1 says this. It says that is pure and undefiled religion before God. So we can't forsake our children. We can't forsake our widows. But here we have this Hellenistic Jews against the native Jews. And this is actually Hebra, Hebronic or Hebrew Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, now you, okay, now I just confused you. The twelve, I thought Judas hung himself. He did. But remember in chapter one, what did they do? They voted Matthias in to become the twelfth disciple. So when you think about it, there's actually 13 and not 12. Kind of blows your, blows your traditional thinking on it. But it's Bible. So if I preach Bible and it blows your traditional thinking, get rid of your tradition and hold on to the word. Amen. Um, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Now, for some of us in here, that would be kind of like, oh boy, pastor's being a smart aleck. He's telling me that he can't go see widows because he needs to do this. <laughs> That's not what they were trying to do. But when you got 50,000 people, you got a lot of widows. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. So there's a delegation of ministry that's happening here. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Proturius, and Nicar, and, and Timian, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these were brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. And notice right here, it says the word of God kept on spreading and the number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And I believe many translations, that word increase there actually says multiply. Now here's, here's the interesting thing is when you go to verse 1, it says to, uh, there, 
the, the numbers are adding up, but then you get to hear after this complaint arises and the leadership begins to deal with the complaint and they get a hold of the mind of God and they don't lose focus of the task because so, it's so easy when a complaint has arisen in a church to get off focus. Because the enemy loves to do that. To do what? To distract you from his plan. But notice that they didn't lose focus. And because they didn't lose focus, what happens? The addition went to multiplication. Now think about this for a second. If each one of us in here this morning, each one of us in here this morning, brought one person to church next week, we would double in size. Just one person. That's it. If we brought one person the following week and that person was to come back, what have we just done? We went from double to now what? Triple. Think about this. Think of the math. You're thinking, oh, you're just thinking of numbers. God is, uh, God's caught up in numbers, but you know who goes out and gets the numbers? We do. If they're not here, it's because we're not bringing them here. It's that simple. We're not talking to our neighbors. We're not talking to the different people that are out there that are not saved. And we're not doing the job that God has called us to do to go out and be a witness in this world. So it means if, if increase isn't happening, because God does give increase, the harvest is ripe. It's ready. If it's not happening, it's because we're not doing our part. You're saying, well, that's the pastor's job. Really? Okay. I love that piece of the job, but don't be complaining when I don't show up at your house and I don't show up at this and I don't show up at that because I'm busy trying to get people here. Uh, yeah, I said it. Why, 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 why did it, why is that, so, why is that the case? Because what is the pastor's job? The pastor's job is to equip you to go out and do it. You don't see scripture saying the pastor's job is to go out and do everything. It's the pastor's job to equip you so that you can do what God has equipped you to do in the work of the ministry. So you all have gifts. You all have different things that are going on. And this is exactly what they recognize. These 12 recognize I can't do everything. I've got to appoint some people in charge of this in order to take over because there's a need that needs to be met and I can't do it. And so what do they do? They appoint these seven. Now here's the beautiful thing about this is these seven are Hellenistic Jews. They're not Hebronic Jews. They're not Hebrew Jews. They're Hellenistic Jews. They're Greek-speaking Jews. So what did they do? They diversified the leadership. It's pretty interesting. Recently, I heard a, a story, and I, I want you to think about this for a second. This is, this is so funny. Mm -hmm. Serious, but funny. Recently, I heard a story from a friend who was taught, to write from his, taught, to, taught how to write from his aunt who was left-handed. As my friend learned to write, he would literally copy what his aunt was doing, but everything that he copied, it was backwards. Instead of writing from left to right, he wrote from right to left, and all the letters would appear backwards. Yet if you took the paper that was written this way and go this way, it was right. You take it this way and go this way, it was right. But if you looked at it straight on, it was always wrong. <laughs> After a few months, his parents had discovered that it was not that he had dyslexia or anything, but that he was trying to write left-handed when he was a right-handed person. It's kind of interesting. Thankfully, they discovered that that was the issue. He was left-handed. Now, here's something I want you to think about. Left-handed people make up roughly about 10 or 15 percent of the population. Oh, Tracy's left-handed. You would be. <laughs> In other words, if you think about it, if left-handed people make up about 10 or 15 percent of the population, they could probably be considered what? A minority group. They really could. They could be considered a minority group. So here we have, in other words, as a minority group of 10 or 15 percent of the population. But we know they have different struggles. And I, want, I want you to just listen to some of the struggles of a left-handed person in a right-handed world. <laughs> listen, listen, it's crazy. They must think about where they're going to sit at a table so they don't bump elbows and bump your food out of your hand. 
must reprogram their thinking when giving a right-handed handshake. Must reprogram the mind when zipping up their pants and buttoning up their shirt. Usually losing to the right-handed people in arm wrestling because the less predominant hand is normally weaker in that arm. So they never win at arm wrestling because there's it's hard to find a left-handed person to arm wrestle with. Writing a check mark seems awkward and backwards to them. When writing, they get ink or lead all over the sides of their hands. Because people typically teach youngsters how to write right-handed, and they are lefty, people attempt to test them for issues when writing doesn't come easily to them. So they think they have dyslexia, they think they have all these issues, and they have none of these issues. They're just a left-handed kid. And at that clock, think about this for a second. Think about the clock. Why does it always have to go right to be correct? Why can't it go left and be correct? Think about that one. Awkward. Odd. Weird. But our clocks do that. They go right. They don't go left. And it has to go right to do what? Be correct. See, lefties are given stigmas. They have, it, they have all kinds of different issues in life that we don't encounter every day. But they do, although they do, they have, they, they do have many good things about them, there's one thing that they have right. They're always thinking in the right mind. So as right-handed are thinking in the left side of the brain and the left-handed are always thinking in the right side of the brain. This is truth. So in a world of right-handed people, do we accommodate for the difference of a lefty or does a lefty accommodate for the righty? Neither. We accommodate for one another. Think about that. We accommodate for one another all the time. We do not separate because of differences, but learn to unify and utilize each other's strength. We learn to exist as one. Being a lefty does not make anyone better, doesn't make them worse, just makes them different. Being a lefty, that is a privilege of being the only one thinking in the right mind. You're saying, what in the world does it have to do with anything? I want you to think about the principle of that. It's so simple. It's so simple. So, in such a different world with different righty and lefty people, we, we learn to appreciate and we learn to embrace each other's differences as a lefty or a righty. But how often do we find ourselves not practicing the same simple principle when it comes to different people within our congregations. We want them to do what? Be just like us. You're saying that is so simple. That's such a simple principle. It is a very simple principle. It's so simple that we don't even think about it anymore. We just accommodate for one another. Does it mean that it kind of takes you out of your comfort zone as a righty when a lefty comes along? Yeah, it kind of does because if I sit next to a lefty who's over here eating and I'm a righty, I'm like this, I may have to create a little bit of space between us so I'm not bumping elbows. I may have to rethink where I'm going to sit so that they can freely eat and I can freely eat and we enjoy each other's company without the right elbow and the left elbow hitting one another. But we do it so easily. We don't even think about it. We just do it. We accommodate for one another. Why? Because we love one another. We don't see it, we don't see each other as different in a sense of a bad way or anything like that. But we see each other different, yet still one. And this is kind of what is going on here in, in, this, in, the, in the church situation between these Hellenistic Jews and these Hebronic Jews. Because the Hebronic Jews were Jews that were from a Jewish background. Some would consider them traditionalists. Some would consider them individuals that went completely from the Mosaic law. But then you had the Hellenistic Jews that were Greek. 
They were from a culture that was very loud and boisterous and charismatic and, and their worship. I mean, if you think about the different Greek gods that they served and the things that they did to serve these false gods, you would know they were very demonstrative. So you have two different groups of people here that are going on. Now, here's the problem is that the Jewish Hebrews or the Hebrew Jews or however you want to Hebronic Jews that were saved, they saw Hellenistic Jews as half-breeds, no different than Samaritans. The Hellenistic saw the Hebronic Jews as holier than thou's. Think about that for a second. In a world that we have so much difference, so much different expression, so much difference in thinking, so much difference in perspective, all evolving around the same message. We get more concerned and tied up sometimes about our difference in expression than we do about people taking the Word of God out of context. When the word of God should be what we are concerned about, holding to the principles of scripture should be what we're concerned about, and then allowing our differences, allowing our ideas, and allowing our expressions and everything else just come together as one in a freely environment that is non-judgmental, but is loving and accepting and embracing. Could you imagine us righties, and I'm a righty, looking at Tracy and saying, Tracy, you ain't welcome to my house because you're a lefty. That means I have to accommodate for you, and that makes me uncomfortable. Could you imagine that? That is sad, but we live in a world that, that happens in so many different circles. Now, in, in my world, because, you know, I've got... You know, it's no secret. My, my oldest stepdaughter is part Hispanic, part black. So I've got a whole portion of my family that is, is a you know, black family. But then I've got Bella and Isaiah, that are, which is their mom is Hispanic. And so, you know, I've got a whole Hispanic side of the family. And then you got me that is white. So when, when I think of people not accepting difference, I think of people being a bigot. I think of people that are being harsh, pious, because they don't know how to accept difference. And so when these Hellenistic Jews came to the disciples with this dispute, this idea was already going on in their minds because they already knew how the Hebronic Jews saw them. They knew that they were seen as half-breeds. They knew that they were seen as out of order. They knew that they were seen as people that weren't like me. And so when they came to the disciples and gave this complaint, the enemy could have easily allowed the difference to create division. But notice that the church doesn't do that. What does the church do? Well, for one, they don't even recognize the difference. You don't see here in the scriptures at all them even recognizing the difference. Peter, the disciples, they don't, they don't even recognize the difference. Why? Because it's not an essential. The essential is, is the widows are being forsaken. Now, whether it's by neglect, whether it's intentional or unintentional, the word of God really never clearly tells us. But the essential was, is that the widows were being overlooked. So what does what does that what do what do they do as leadership? And I think it's so creative. What do they do as leadership? They put Hellenistic Jews in leadership to kind of change up the leadership. So you got a demographic of each group. Why? Why? Because they knew, and I'm sure they were reminded of the words that Jesus prayed for all believers to be one. To be one. Well, one makes me uncomfortable. You ain't going to like heaven. Because in heaven, there's going to be Pentecostals and Baptists and Christian and Methodists and 
Episcopalian and Presbyterian and on and on and on in heaven. And then you think about all those different types of expressions. If any of them make you uncomfortable, heaven is going to make you uncomfortable. So what is that? What does that tell me? What does that tell me? That tells me that we have an opportunity to do one of two things as the church brings in new people and people have different expressions. And, you know, we get young people in here and they get fired up for God. I'm going to tell you what, you're not going to have kids sitting in a pew. They're most likely going to want to come down here and worship God because that's what young people do nowadays. That's just what happens. Well, that makes me feel uncomfortable. Then you don't want young people because if you really want young people, you'll do whatever you have to do to get them to church and get them on fire for Jesus, even if it makes you uncomfortable because it's outside your box or your wheel or your realm. The problem is never does God want to do it. The problem is never will God do it. The problem is, is will we change to allow him to do it? That's the problem. But we don't a lot of times want to embrace that. And here we have this church. The enemy could have so easily used their difference and their diversity to create division. And how many times have we seen congregations over and over and over again because of something that has nothing to do with the word of God, something that has nothing to do with kingdom business, divide why are they like that? Because they're, they're acting just like Paul says. And I want to read this, what Paul says. It's really interesting because Paul says this. He says, now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you, now, I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispius and Gallius, so that none of you would say that I was baptized in my name. <laughs> How I did, now I did baptize also the house of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized any, any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not, to, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. And this is what Paul says in chapter 3, 1 through 4, finishing out a statement regarding this. He said, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not yet able. For you are still fleshly. Now, okay, why are they still fleshly? Well, he's about ready to answer this. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? For one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos. Are you not mere men? What was Paul telling them? Get over your differences and be united in Christ. For what purpose? For kingdom purpose. To get over the fact that you think you're of this persuasion or that persuasion or whatever. You know, I've been doing some heavy studying on independent Christian church because, you know, I need to do some studying on that. And one of the things that I really enjoyed about studying about the history on this, no different than the Foursquare, is there was a similar frame of thought is they did not like formalized religion that says I'm Presbyterian or I'm Methodist or I'm Baptist or I'm Pentecostal, but they wanted to unite under one theme and that was the word of God. Why? Because in the early beginning, they saw a need to unite the church together as one, freely expressing themselves however people wanted to express themselves to give God glory and the praise of the Lord as long as they were holding to the word of God. 
I don't know about you, but I would love to go to a church like that where all the name tags and everything else just drop off. Where I could walk in and just say, I am a Christian and I am free to come to this church and express God, express my worship to God and how I love God any way I want to as long as it's found in the scriptures. I would love to be in a place like that. But how many knows that we fall from where we have begun in so many ways? The Methodist church. I'm not going to generalize all Methodist churches and please don't take this statement as as that but the Methodist church started out in the theme of holiness look where they're at now why because they forgot where they came from why some didn't even know where they came from it kind of goes back to that old, that old idea of putting this roast in a pan you know, generations go on and on, and all of a sudden, grandma's there, and great grandma's there, and now the new wife that's on the thing cuts the end off, and great grandma's like, Well, what'd you do that for? Well, you did it, and they did it, and they did it. Well, grandma, why'd you cut the end off? Because it didn't fit in the pan I had. Had nothing to do with the meat, it had nothing to do with the roast. It had the fact that they did not understand where they come from, they did not understand their background, they didn't understand the unity and the oneness of who they were. And what was needing to be done. See, this passage teaches us a really good lesson about church, about doing church. That we have got to major on the majors. This right here. We've got to major on the majors and minor on the minors. Who wants to come to a place who's divisive and hostile? Who wants to come to a place that's not accepted or loving? Who wants to come to a place that they don't feel free? Nobody. So what does that tell us? That tells us that we individually have to change. That makes us uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And you know why it makes you uncomfortable? Because the kingdom is not about you. It's about him. And when we make it about me, that's when it begins to make me feel uncomfortable. Again, why are you uncomfortable? Because it becomes about you. But when it becomes about him... We get excited when people come in with new ideas and new ways of doing things and new expressions and new ideas as long as they line up with the Word of God. Or we can be like the people that Paul said in Corinthians and just be people of mere flesh, infants in the Lord, just spiritually unaware, never growing, not maturing, Because we allow quarrels and complaints and divisions and hostilities and all these other things go on. Or we can get some backbone and say, you know what? It's not about me. It's about these kids up here. It's about the youth. It's about reaching the next generation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know what? That makes me uncomfortable. It makes me very uncomfortable. Why does it make me uncomfortable? And you're like, Pastor Boy, you just like, you're like the most free person in the world. You just like accept anybody and really don't care. And you know what? In a way, that's true. But you don't know there's inner workings of my heart and some things that I have to constantly work on because I am uncomfortable with when it is allowing other people with different ideas and different expressions and different backgrounds come into my circle. But why do I allow them to come into my circle? Why do I become loving and accepting and embracing of them? Because I know it's not about me. It's not about me. 
So the enemy could have used that in the church and brought great division in Acts chapter 6. Unfortunately, a lot of churches around this world have allowed the enemy to use that as a divisive thing and church split happens. But the early church didn't. They said, let's embrace one another. There is a valid need that widows need to be taken care of. So I tell you what we're going to do. Because up to this point, all the leadership was Jewish. They were Hebrew leaders from Hebrew background, had walked with Jesus up to this point. But what do they do? They shake it up and they say, you know what? We're going to embrace your difference to the point. We're going to put you in charge of some things. We're going to put you to work. We're going to allow you to serve. We're going to allow you to do this. Why? Because we have to be one people. One group. I don't want to just return King Hill Christian back to some of the roots of, of the philosophies and the thinking of the early founders of an independent Christian church. I want to return our church back to the foundations of the book of Acts, the earliest Christian church. Because if we can't get this right, how are we going to get anything else right? But to do this we got to get out of the box and realize it's not about me. It's about those that are lost. It's about the kingdom. I mean, think about how church people back then would have felt if Jesus came in the house and said, whoop, I only got five minutes for you. I'm not here for you. I'm out for the lost. We'd get mad. You mean Jesus didn't come to my house and he didn't preach a sermon in my house? You mean Jesus? Blah, 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 blah. I mean, we would just, I mean, let's be real. But then that exactly what Jesus said. Jesus said, I'm not here. I'm not here to come for Israel. I'm not here for the Jews. I'm not here for those that aren't sick. I'm here for the lost. I'm here to win the world. And this is what Jesus does. And we know it so clearly that that's exactly what he does. So I just have, I'm going to leave you just with this one question. Just, just, it's a simple question. But I think it's a question that, that we need to ask ourselves. And I'm not just talking about asking ourselves as a church, but even asking ourselves personally. And I'm actually going to read this because I don't want to get this question wrong and ask it in the wrong way. But I want to ask this question. See, the question does not consist of whether we will grow, whether we will need to diversify, whether we will need to think outside the box, or whether we will need to change. The question consists of whether we will be shining witnesses to the world as a diversified church, how we love and appreciate one another, even in our differences. The, conclusion, the conclusive question remains is this, We'll be a people of diversified unity or divisive people because of our diversity. I'm going to ask that question again. Will we be a people of diversified unity or a divisive people because of our diversity? My prayer is we become one. My prayer is, is we see through the eyes of Jesus. My prayer is, is that we step up and step in like the leaders of the early church. Major in the majors, minor in the minors, and win the world for God. That means not being comfortable. That means thinking outside the box. That means when it's oh me, when a message is preached, it's oh me and I deal with the oh me. When it's an amen, I'm with the person over here that got the victory just like I did. It's a tough question to ask. 
This is why I love the book of Acts, because it's so real and it's so relevant. And it always hits home somewhere. 